Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. To differentiate is actually understand what value you create that others don't. People don't buy things because they, um, it has a function or feature. They buy it because of the value it creates for them. And if you can differentiate your value, then that will allow you to differentiate your product or your innovation. Welcome back. I hope your week's been awesome so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with co-author of the book New to Big, David Kidder, and with customer and employee experience advocate, Jason Bradshaw, then do check them out, but only after you've listened to today's episode. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Steve Weinstein. With a background that spans technology, product development and entertainment, Steve is an innovation expert, an entrepreneur and educator who enjoys building products or teaching others how to build companies using lean startup techniques. Steve is a Senior VP of Strategy at BMNT Inc., helping to create pipelines of innovation that companies, government agencies and other large organisations can use to stay competitive. A former C-level executive at a number of startups, Steve teaches entrepreneurship classes, including Steve Blank's Lean Launchpad course, as well as Hacking for Defence and its sister courses Hacking for Social Impact and Hacking for Oceans at multiple major universities, including UC Berkeley and Stanford. Before joining BMNT, Steve was founder and CEO of Motion Picture Laboratories, the Silicon Valley-based R&D Centre funded directly by the six Hollywood major studios. He was Chief Technology Officer of Deluxe Entertainment, guided the transition from physical technologies to e-commerce at Rovi Corporation and at Vicinity, a mapping company that was acquired by Microsoft in 2002. In our discussion today, Steve talked to me about creating value beyond the profit dollars. We talked about the impact of customer perception on brands. And we talked about what mission-driven organisations are and how they behave. So without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Steve Weinstein. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Palo Alto in California, and that's in the USA, of course, Steve Weinstein, who's an innovation expert, an entrepreneur, an educator, and he enjoys building products or teaching others to build products and companies that use the lean startup techniques. Steve's also Senior VP of Strategy at BMNT Inc., Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Steve. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you, Orgut. Thank you. Pleasure to be on here. Now, Pete Newell, who I think is also with BMNT, right? He, he was That's our correct. guest on episode 346 of the Innova Buzz podcast. He introduced us to you and suggested that we have a conversation. Great. I'm glad he did. Yeah. Now, as I said, you enjoy building products or teaching other how, others how to build companies using the lean startup. Now, what, what is it that drives that passion? Well, what drives it is I love to see product in people's hands. 
You know, I've been lucky in my life to have product go from everywhere from um, in, a unique bespoke system in one person's hands to making software in my younger days that was in millions and millions of products. You know, like every, you know, video games to um, mouse drivers for computer mice, um, all the way, you know, so there's something neat to go into a store, see something you made on the shelf or, or hear people talking about a product you made. You know, that's the excitement of it, you know, seeing the impact. Hmm. Yeah. It's, um, it's certainly something that I'm, I'm sure you've, um, you've developed over the years in terms of the experience you've had. And, and I know you also worked in the movie industry, entertainment industry early on in your career. So what were some of the lessons out of that in terms of entrepreneurship and creating products? Well, I think um, so in my career, I always liked where um, media hit technology. I mean, for some reason, I always gravitated where technology hit, you know, whether it's the visual arts, the print arts, the music, the sound arts. And, you know, creativity is a form of, of entrepreneurship. It's a form of innovation, right? I mean, before you start with a blank piece of paper or a blank idea and you create something and at the end of it, you have a movie, you have a song, you have something. And I always liked the idea of making tools and, and helping those people um, create something. Um, and, you, you know, so, you know, one being a tool in somebody's tool chest is, is more fun than just being the end user product and innovation with creatives is, um, is very different. I mean, you know, you have all these different constituencies that, you know, you're kind of trying to get to work together, a creative temperament, as they say, working together with, um, the technology engineer who is sometimes wants repeatable and predictable. And then you have on top of that, the idea that you want to make, um, you know, a business out of it, make a profit so you can live another day. Hmm. Right? You know, with your podcast, right? I mean, it, it, you need to have a little bit of commercialization to afford to do it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Got to have, got to have some uh, revenue coming in to cover costs at least and, and yep. perhaps keep, keep the food on the table. Yeah. All right. Um, now, you, you talk a lot about mission-driven entrepreneurship. So what does that mean to you? So, um, so as... I spent most of my career dreaming up ideas that, um, and working with people who had ideas and creating companies or creating products for them. You know, in the last, I say five or six years, you know, like I spent some time with Steve Blank, who I think was on your, I had yeah, a podcast yeah. with you a long time ago, and Alexander Osterwalder, who I think also had a podcast with you. Yes. Um, and, you know, and, this whole lean movement of the lean startup that him and those two and Eric Reese created, um, you know, was basically, I have a good idea. Does anybody care? Will they buy it if I make one? Okay. And that kind of resonated with me, but over time I was thinking, well, what's the impact? What does it change the world? Is the world a better place? And for a long time, I maybe, convinced myself that entertainment, the world is a better place. People are happier, less stress, lower, you know, but as I gotten a little older, I realized that maybe not be enough. And so is there an idea that you have a mission or, you know, for the social good, you know, solving ocean health. I've been involved in a, in a university program called hacking for oceans, environmental oceans, you know, can you be driven in such a way that you can marry entrepreneurship with social impact and whether it's social and, and together. And those are what I'll call mission-driven entrepreneurs, people who have a mission, usually for the social good, and yet they have the creative streak to want to do it in, you know, by bringing a new technology to market or even just changing public behavior or, or personal behavior, right? I mean, if you think about all the challenges the world is facing, you know, whether it's COVID, or currently, or it's um, um, ocean health and pollution, you know, that everybody's facing global warming. Um, all of those things are going to take kind of what I'll call horizon three moonshot kind of approaches mm -hmm. and solutions. And you're not going to get those by doing the, you know, in the U.S. they have this phrase, leave no footprints research. You know, a lot of people yeah. in so or do leave no footprints. You know, we're past the time of leave no footprints um, and we're going to have to make and so how can you take mission that's, um, you know, I think probably Pete spoke about mission driven in terms of defense and national security, 
how can you bring that to a bigger audience in the social good, the environment, um, in diplomacy, and, and a lot of other areas? Sustainment. Hope that answered your question. Yeah, well, it, it does. It's a fascinating topic. And one, one of the things I'm curious about, I mean, a lot of people talk about the environment and global warming. And and I mean, I know there's there's been a movement here for a long time called Cleaning Up Australia. And basically, it's a there's a day, which is a bit um, a small drop in the ocean, really. But there's a day where people are asked to volunteer and go out and clean up rubbish that, that gets dumped around. Now, I, I go out bike riding a lot and I'm always surprised that you know there's piles of rubbish sometimes just dumped on the side of the road that people are too lazy to drive to um, a, a recycling station or a, a proper um, tip for for that rubbish and so what how can we as individuals and as entrepreneurs that are in business to kind of we get our buzz from business and creating something and and generating revenue from that business how can we identify the areas that really um, can contribute to the greater good, but that we're also really passionate about so that there's a, uh, a drive there for us to do something rather than just uh, you know, face value, I care about this because it's the right, uh, because it looks good. Well, I think, I mean, it's a, there are lots of multi-dimensions to your question, but um, I think the one is, are Entrepreneurs are mostly driven by passion. It's a calling. You know, I, mm. I tend to think that. So therefore, if you are driven by um, creation or driven by change or uh, adoption, if you're driven by financial reward, solving the world's ecological problems or social good problems is probably you're, you're, you're not going to get your MBA at a university for that. Um, and and to, so you have to have a mindset that you're willing to spend time. I mean, I mean, almost everybody in civil service, anybody who goes into politics, anybody who um, goes into a lot of other prof professions, apologize for the train, uh, I live on the train track. Um, all of those people are, um, are driven to solve more than just economic enrichment. So if you get, better, lack of a better word, psychic income from changing the world or changing impact, that's the first step. You have to want to do it, right? I mean, else you're just going to be a donation, um, right? So you have to want to do it. The question is, can you find others who want to do it with you? And are you willing to spend years of your life trying to pursue it? Um, there's no magic formula the same way that some people are best to start company, some best are to join a company, and some best are to you know, be independent of a company. So I don't think there's like a magical answer there. Um, but I do think if you're interested there, you know, even though the challenges are huge, like rubbish aside the side of the road, there are companies that you could create that are better than an app that is a social media app that could have the same enjoyment for you. It has the same technological problems, has the same go to market adoption, all those things that build businesses. The profit margins might not be the same and the funding mechanisms might be different, but nevertheless, they will have the same enjoyment if you're an entrepreneur. They really were. And then it's, you know, and, and then if you get social, um, um, you know, do-gooder points in your mind, you know, feeling good about yourself, right, you will um, definitely, there's something very nice to see, oh, I was responsible um, for even a small change, right? I mean, a small change. I mean, if you think about why you would go into this, right? You know, what's the advantage of doing like social entrepreneurship in the entrepreneur sense? Well, one, I think if you build a company built around the tech or, or however you build it, you'll feel good about yourself and you can build a brand that's exciting, right? A brand that mm. stands for something, right? I mean, you know, a lot of these brands, what does Microsoft stand for? What does Google stand for? You know, we were talking earlier about how Google, you know, do no evil, um, right? I mean, you know, really, probably not. But if you build a, um, a brand that, you know, is, is changing the world in terms of, you know, it, it's reducing methane emissions, it's um, a replacement for microplastics, it's, um, you know, has an impact on homelessness, on access to healthcare, that brand 
is much more valuable and you'll feel much more better about your brand. Hmm. Now, the other thing is it's, you can attract a person who will have a lot more integrity. Your team will be much more driven in a way, willing to put in the extra hours, not willing to run off to the next shiny startup because your team together, you know, you know, they, they're, they're in it with you. You know, there's a downside to that, you know, which is, you know, might not attract all of it. You also, you're, you're really take on big goal, big, big solutions. You're, you're we're going to take on the rubbish problem on the, you know, uh, across, mm. uh, uh, you know, and that might be, you know, it's not just, you know, whatever you called it, pickup day, um, you know, a, a day yeah. of clean. It might be, well, what is the trash? Where did that trash come from? Mm. Is it made yeah. out of material that it should have never been? Right. I mean, you know, uh, everywhere in the world, you know, they got all, you know, alternative st plastic straws, right? Because plastic straws became their, you know, the cool thing um, mm -hmm. to get rid of. Um, realistically, the solution to straws was no straws. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right. 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 We really made it. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, yes, some people knew sippy cups for kids and, you know, and boba drinks and stuff like that. But 99% of the people could have said, I don't need a straw rather than reflect the straw. So, you know, can you bring a different mindset to it? And, and together, you know, you are, you can have an impact. I mean, if a lot of entrepreneurs, they like, you know, what are they in it for? They're in it for a scorecard in their mind. And hopefully we can build a generation of, of people who they think the impact is how to judge success. Not mm -hmm. that they're on the, you know, richest people in the world index. Yeah. That's a long answer to your question, but hopefully it, not. Yes, that does. So, um, yeah, but certainly, like, I mean, they're, they're obviously ego is a big thing in entrepreneurship and we like to feel good about ourselves. And, and as you point out, there's lots of different ways to do that. So you don't need to simply restrict it to aspiring to the rich 500 list or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, but but you do want to be respected by your peers, hmm. right? I mean, the people who you, I mean, but entrepreneurship, at least for me, I, I came to Silicon Valley quite a while ago. You know, the notion of riches was exceptionally foreign. Okay, I mean, it didn't even cross, I think, anybody I was hung out with in those days. Um, um, only in the recent, you know, when nerds became cool um, and, 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 venture capital overcompensated, you know, for extracting value before the value was created, um, uh, came into being, right? Because, right, I mean, you know, people, companies close all the time. That doesn't mean the venture capitalists, the risk capital, the people involved lost money, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, WeWork, which is the big flame out um, yeah. uh, worldwide, you know, basically all the early investors still made a ton of money, 10 times their money. Um, yet, they didn't make anything that's sustained, right? Hmm. And so we, the, there's kind of a, the 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 weights have changed on you know when value is created. When I came out here, value was created when your company was profitable, um, and that was the first metric of of ability to extract money out um, or, or rewards out. Now it it's only you know that's step like twenty, right? I hmm. mean, and, and 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 the thing. So that's um, so hopefully. Those people, you know, who who are attracted to that, I think, and it seems to be true, if you open people's eyes, that there's another path that maybe not as lucrative, but definitely as rewarding, it, it, it seems to be resonating. It seems to be that there's an unmet need of, of bringing entrepreneurship to mission-driven individuals. Hmm. You know, you see a little bit of it, but it's just be I can see it now, you know, in, in the universities I, I, I'm involved with and in the programs I'm involved with that, you know, kind of it, it with, gov in, with the governments. Hmm. So what are some of the, well, I'll come back to the universities in a moment, but what are some of the challenges in, in building a company that kind of, in a way, it's two different purposes, right? There's serving the clients and helping them achieve their goals that your product or service can help them achieve. And at the same time, this passion that, let's say, I have as the entrepreneur to have an influence on the world 
beyond my company and beyond my customer base. Yeah, so I mean, I think it actually gets a little more parsed than that. There are companies that have social good that can be very profitable. Okay, you could argue that electric cars, right, mm -hmm. are better for the environment, better for the world, um, um, in all those regards, and that's a very clear case of having a kind of emission-driven, getting rid of gas combustion, and creating Tesla, right? You know, they're in um, the um, the synthetic or artificial meat industry, you know, mm -hmm. is another case of, you know, they can make a pure profit margin and also do good, yeah. right? You know, and, and, and those and seem, that's obviously the ideal combination, something that is, you know, desired and has, and social good in the same bucket. There is this next category of what you were thinking, you know, where the profit margin possibly suspect, okay? And, and in fact, without government support, you probably even can't make a viable business, right? And, and, and then how do you trade off whether the, you know, the two sides of the business, the social good side and the, you know, barely profitable side. And I think you have to get much more creative in, um, in how you fund them, you know, where, where you, um, how you reach your public and engage a much bigger kind of universe of partners and, um, and participants than you normally would. Right. You know, in a normal company, you bring your product, you go to market, you convince people to buy it, um, you get a distribution channel, and hopefully the economics work. In the social good space or the impact space, you have to kind of get buy-in and support. You might have to get legislative, you know, all the way up legal support. You, you have all these people that you need to build a coalition around that is different than a traditional company. Um, but nevertheless, I think you can trade those off, but you have to be driven to basically on the goal of, you know, what is the goal of the company, right? Is the, and, and that requires a different mix of individuals, right? Mm -hmm. And to your question is, I don't think it's, you know, either or, it's just that you've, you've basically said the goal of the company is X, right? Mm -hmm. Reduce carbon emissions, you know, um, reduce microplastics, convert people away from nitrates in the water streams, right? Um, you know, would be, you know, ones that are big goals and then how do you get there could either be very profitable or unfortunately not. Yeah, yeah. All right, and um, coming back to, you you mentioned universities and they're changing their mindset a little bit about how they approach this. So what's the role of of educators in general, I guess, in creating kind of this awareness in people going through the education system that um, you know, to go into entrepreneurship or even business in general that there, there should be some um, something for the greater good there as well as just um, you know the traditional role that I grew up with certainly of you know get a good job earn a lot of money um, become wealthy and you'll be happy yep um, yeah I mean I think universities themselves and I think you know, when you think about Gen Z, that's the people going through um, schools right now, they already are starting, seem to have, and again, they're, it's young, a moral compass, okay? That they, you know, they, you know, brands are being broken right now because they don't stand for what the, the generation thinks is, um, is good, right? So you already have, educators are already having this audience that is not necessarily valuing what you said is the, you know, the, the responsibility of the school. Okay. Mm. The, so you already have a willing audience. The second thing is, is that it's academia's um, responsibility to show people that entrepreneurship, if that's the, you know, what they are trying to create as part of their programs, that there are other avenues for entrepreneurship, it, right? It, you know, in most universities, it's either take your research and expose it to the world and license it. And, and you know, if you have a social impact or uh, impact idea on that, you know, you can um, influence what research goes on in your university. Um, there's a responsibility, of the, my opinion, of the um, university to have courses that show that entrepreneurship can have a goal, not necessarily a different goal than create the company goal. And, you know, whether it's, as Pete Newell probably spoke about, hacking for defense, 
um, um, hacking, you know, entrepreneurship for oceans, for um, sustainability, for political, you know, um, freedom of the press, um, you know, um, you know, kind of get the word out to um, preventing the, 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 the bad word out, all of those things. I think it's the response of the university to open the eyes of their students. I, I unfortunately or fortunately, depending upon your, my day of thinking about it, live in Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley basically manufactures people who go to Google, Amazon, <laughs> Apple, Facebook, uh, Salesforce. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a semi machine. And those, pe those, those companies are hoovering up all the talent, okay? And or not, but a huge amount of the talent, an unfair amount of the talent. Hmm. And I think it's universities' responsibilities to have classes that open the eyes of these millennials who are already disposed to thinking about the moral um, compass of the company they're joining and how do they, you know, and to have courses that bring together and these sort of um, entrepreneurship for social um, impact or mission-driven entrepreneurship usually brings a much more diverse group of people to the table. It brings people from policy. It brings people from the law. It brings people from um, you know, the medical. It brings people, not just engineers and B MBAs. And so it also allows universities to kind of bring a bigger community together to hopefully solve some of the bigger issues. You know, you know, each institution has to decide what, how they measure their success. And hopefully some of them will measure their success, not just by what impact they have. Right. I mean, this is a problem and I'm going to divert off and I apologize <laughs> uh, it, to um, foundations in, in, in mission driven foundations for years. Didn't worry about the impact. They did not measure impact. It's only with this cadre of, of recent um, last 10, 15 years of, of new foundations founded on entrepreneurial recent money have decided, what is the impact of my money coming in? How do I measure that impact? Hmm. How do I know? And I think that's filtering out to grant money that's going into universities, which is changing the mindset of people in universities, which is also changing, you know, and then we have these students coming in already predisposed. So I think it's a very strong, very vital responsibility of the university. Absolutely. Else we're going to end up with more um, social media apps. Unless... <laughs> <laughs> well, you touched on something there and we were having this conversation before we started recording and that's the, you know, the power of the big uh, tech companies. And uh, you mentioned that most of the Silicon Valley institutions and, and I think it's probably true of some of the um, Ivy League universities across the USA that the uh, talent gets hoovered up, as you said, by the the tech giants. And and uh, full disclosure, my son works for Google, so I've got a little bit of insight into how things operate there. And he didn't come through the university system in in the USA. He went through um, university here in Melbourne and then in um, Germany did uh, a master's degree there and ended up with Google through that channel. So, you know, they're, they're probably hoovering up more than just uh, just the US universities. So what, what do you see as the big tech company's responsibility for kind of, and, and it's, it's almost like they have to abdicate some of their power, but to give back to society and get the, uh, rebalance the whole uh, environment so that there's good going back into you know, these mission-driven initiatives and, and these big issues that, that we face as a species? Well, I would hope they have a responsibility there, but that's their responsibilities to their shareholders. Mm. And, um, and for most of them, unless you're, there's called a beneficial com company in the United States. It's a designated non it's like not a non-profit but not a full for-profit it's there's a designation that i'm a beneficial company uh but if you're a for-profit company well i hope you have a responsibility and they all you know at some level do right i mean they you know google does do some you know things to bring the internet to everyone and do but they're based in corporate um vision um so i don't 
know how you force them to do it unless you force them to do it. Hmm. Um, right. I mean, cause, um, I would say that for every good that, um, some of these companies go, do, we could probably show, you know, that it's offset by the bad that they do. Right. I mean, and so is it guilt money, tobacco money, you know, going into, you know, hmm. kind of, um, research. Um, I, I, I wish it was true. I think, um, luckily though, if you look at the founders of these companies, you know, Salesforce, Benioff, Benioff is spending you know, is actually an active, you know, foundation investor in a lot of social impact, you know, obviously the Gates Foundation, um, you know, um, the Page, you know, um, Schmidt, mm -hmm. all of those people, you know, bringing Google up, you know, they realized at the end that, you know, the money they made, you know, um, maybe should be used to give back, right? The companies themselves, it's tough. If I'm a shareholder, I'm tough to do it. I mean, the, the, the thing that you need to think about is, is it the government's responsibility to prevent these, you know, to kind of siphon off some of the money somehow, right? I mean, do, do, should a founder of a company make a billion dollars in five years, hmm. right? Right. I mean, yeah. but, you know, it seems yeah. like, you know, well, when, effort they, in, when they sell kind of overnight. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, effort in versus effort out, it's, it seems mi misplaced, right? Um, you think entrepreneurship would change? Uh, I was speaking to Steve Blank about this, or he was speaking to me about it, um, was you think entrepreneurship would change if we put caps on things? <laughs> like you could only make this much money, you could only make this. And I think, and then what do you do with that excess? And if you could force it into, you know, kind of being used for social good, because, you know, at some level until it really hits home for them, um, right, it impacts their their bottom line, I think it's going to take that for these companies to take some of this seriously, hmm. right? I mean, like if all of a sudden they realize they're losing market share, right, to um, something else, you know, there are companies, you know, um, but they're all are kind of more drop in the ocean, pun intended, um, kind of impacts, right? You know, can Google, if Google put their mindset to it, do more for certain topics? I think a lot of them, the one good thing is, and this is maybe Silicon Valley is, um, is the whole open source movement, hmm. right? The, giving the, the software out to the world and hopefully somebody else will take those tools and do something good. I think is, you know, the level that I would hope they all would aspire to rather than really taking on some problem in the, um, the, you know, the world is encountering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, an interesting challenge. And I guess one of the things that, um, I mean, I had a thought, <laughs> An interesting thought because you said, how do you force people to kind of take some of that profit or cap the profit? I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Mike Michalowicz's work around profit first. And he talks about, you know, a business that, I mean, that the old style way is you run your business, you get income, you pay all your expenses and whatever's left over, you uh, either take out as profit or well, you pay pay your employees as well, which are expenses, and then you pay the, the entrepreneur pays themselves from what's left. And then if there's anything left over, that's profit. So he's turned that around and said, well, profit goes first. You take the, you determine what your profit is, you take that out, then you pay the owner, and then you, then you know you've got what's left over is what expenses you can have. So that's all you can afford. So he turns that around and I'm wondering, you know, can you take that philosophy and say, well, first of all, there's there's this contribution to some greater good, some pool that, that does some greater good and yeah. then you do profit and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, again, you know, back to your original, original questions on mission-driven entrepreneurship, part of it is that I want to solve this problem. You can't force people to want to solve it, mm. right? I mean entrepreneurs are driven to do do what they're doing and building teams to solve it forcing a company to do that it's tough right yeah. um you've seen a little bit you know the governments take on like the cost of, of pharma pharma right for third world and, mm. and for um, um places and saying hey it's your social responsibility so they there are cases where government pressure can uh, can um can be brought to bear on on these problems but I think they're going to be more isolated than yeah. all of a sudden Google is going to be, you know, a great place to, uh, and I, and I would say that Google, you know, in some regards, 
um, is doing a lot of stuff because they have a lot of projects, you know, autonomous cars, you can argue mm. good or bad. Um, you could, um, you know, internet for everyone from, you know, with some of their projects and some of the other ones that are giving back or at least are spinning out technologies that could give back. Some of the other ones you could argue are probably not doing their job yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we certainly, I guess with the, the farmer example, there's a, a big challenge coming up right now, right? We've got um, probably about four or five um, really exciting um, developments in the vaccine area. And once, once they're ready for prime time, ready to be released to the public, then then there's the big question about, you know, making that available to everybody, particularly in in third world countries where people can't afford to pay a lot of money and where they're probably needed more than in, in some of the developed world because of the inability for, well, because of the population density really and the conditions that people are living in, in they can't do right, and access to as easily. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you know, and you're you're seeing this exact problem a little bit. If you look at, I read an article yesterday that Canada bought eight or nine doses of vaccine for every in every person in the country, hmm. right? So they overbought. Yeah. They didn't, you know, they hedged their bets. It's like you know, betting on a roulette wheel. Um, the so they kind of sucked up production from all these companies when they might not need it. Um, because they don't need eight or nine um, doses for every person. The, there might be a very good ripple effect from that in the sense that there are going to be all these excess doses that, that these companies made that they might you know, be able to hmm. push off into the, a market at different costs. Uh, night. So, yeah. Hmm. yeah. So, but it is, I mean, um, I think you're seeing very much the bad behaviors and the good behaviors under COVID. Right, the good behavior is everybody got together and is doing discovery on drugs. The bad mm. behavior is I come first when it comes to getting the the, yeah. the vaccine. Yeah, that's right. And and in some ways, the idea of open source there is probably being um, it, it started off in that way, but it's uh, now everybody's uh, in terms from the companies they're saying, "Oh, we're going to patent this particular technology we've got, and then we're not going to make it available to." other people to produce or our competitors in particular. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, um, yeah, I think it's, you know, your the barriers are going to go up again, right? As soon as mm -hmm. we, as soon as the, it, we turn into solving the problem, uh, solve the problem, you're going to see barriers going up, right? Everybody's going to go back to a little bit of behavior as normal. In fact, there's going to be what I'll think of looking in, right? Cause we, I have to get myself healthy, whatever that means. Hmm. The country I need to get healthy, the individual, the company, the family, all have to get healthy, and that's going to make possibly for a less sharing, less you know, open you know, kind of society. Hmm. Right? Yeah. And in some ways, I mean, it's thinking back to entrepreneurship in general, it, it's kind of, again, it's a balance, isn't it? Because if, if I sacrifice my own health, to make somebody else healthy, at some point I'm I'm no good to anyone else, really. So it's a balance between I've got to make sure I'm healthy so I can help others, but I've also got to make sure that I do have the attitude of helping others and not, okay, I'm going to keep everything for myself and, and I'll keep some reserves back just in case, you know, in case I need two or three um, doses of that vaccine i mean maybe maybe when they tell me it's uh, good for a year or two years maybe that will be wrong maybe it'll be only six months so i better have some in reserve right i mean you know um in the united states i don't know if it's the same in, in australia you know um it's a, a version of it's snowing i need to get milk you know in the united states it's you know COVID is coming i need to get toilet paper <laughs> um and there was yeah, a massive bit... run massive <laughs> yeah. run I mean, um, yeah, and, that was and, the first and, thing here that went. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, which is um, right. It was kind of a, a a panic, right? About sure, right? If everybody just said it's not going to be a shortage, nothing would have happened, right? Mm. I mean, but it is this kind of this, you know, inelasticity of of fear uh, versus you know reality, and 
and how it, it rubber bands like the same way if everybody stayed at the same speed on the highway, we'd all go five or 10 miles an hour faster, except everybody goes a little faster, a little slower, a little faster. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I want to get there faster than you, therefore yeah. I'm going to yeah. cause this ripple effect behind mm. me. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of counterintuitive stuff that people don't yeah. understand. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, one other question, The talking about, you know, the, the return for the shareholder and the drive to generate that profit, how can how can we or what what can be done to change uh, that mindset a little bit so that the shareholder accepts that hey you know it's not going to be this skyrocketing return all the time at the expense of other things um, being neglected well i think you have to go for alternative sources of money um, whether it's um, foundation money or venture funds that were set up for social good to begin with risk capital that was set up that they told you going in that you know where our goals are, are are limited to um foundations that just you know it's grant money to um family home offices or rich individuals who realize some part of their wealth they should give back but the notion that you're going to change um the behavior of a venture fund without the support of a partner or the people who gave them money it's you know going to be a little short-sighted right mm. now mind you as we said earlier there are very good ideas that will be mm. profitable okay that will be return will potentially return you know the same level of um of returns as a um and those are the ideal right those are the sweet spot of impact right mm. i mean i think you're talking mostly about the ones where you know the odds are pretty good if your only customer is um is fishers is off off the coast of you know of, of, you know around the you know the odds of making a very profitable business are going to be hard right and mm -hmm. and um and therefore you have to have the investment mindset of those who are contributing that that's okay not everybody you know wants their entire portfolio to be high return high risk mm -hmm. right and this is an asset class right it's high impact solid solid you know average return and then foundations are solid no return you know high impact right so i think it's a continuum hmm. all right well this is fabulous steve i could go on ages exploring these philosophical questions about changing mindset around profit and doing good in the world um, yeah. but i'm just aware of the time I want to be respectful of your time so i think it's a good point now to move on to the buzz which is our innovation round and it's designed to help our, I, I, our I don't remember these questions at all <laughs> and that's fine. It's no There's no wrong answers either. Um, so hopefully you'll give us some insightful answers and inspire our listener to go and do something awesome as a result today. So what do you think the number one thing is anyone needs to do to be more innovative? One thing to be more innovative. It's kind of um, give yourself the time. Give hmm. yourself the time and, and, and set a, a goal. If you don't spend time on task, you know, then uh, you can't be innovative. The other thing is realize what you bring to the party and um, and team up with somebody who brings what you lack. Right? Hmm. You know, it's a coalition. Two people is better than one person for most anything. Right? And yeah. three is probably better than others. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love, the, love that idea. Yeah. Looking for um, connecting with other people and complementing skills. Yeah. Right. All right. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? What's the best thing? Oh, I think it's um, giving back and working with students um, because um, it gives me a whole new mindset. You know, ever since I've started um, being back part of the academic community, um, it's it's being around people who look at the world differently, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm an engineer, and if you when I first started out in my career, I thought I could compute all what everybody was thinking, and then I yeah. could, you know, I was like, I, I knew what it was to do everything, and it's only by being around others, I realize I don't know anything, um, and that they <laughs> their mindset is you know um, is so different. I mean that that that's been the best thing for me to be around others who who live it, who are who are kind of on the beginning of their careers, not in the you know later part, second part of their careers. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I think it was Einstein, wasn't it, that said, uh, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know, and then the more I want to learn. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, being intellectually curious and intellectually um, thinking you don't know. Hmm. I think that's the hardest, I mean, the thing that keeps it, you know, entrepreneurs going, right, is that they hmm. don't know, they think, right? They, they have this idea. Great. All right. Do you have a favorite resource you use most often? For um, for anything, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's um, my network of friends. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's um, it's um, it's kind of trading ideas with others, whether mm. it's um, in COVID, it's you know through um, Zoom or through emails or even texts. I think that's you know I'm a um, unfortunately um, you know kind of a, a voracious reader, so I'll read anything. Serial boxes on out. Um, but um, but I think it's actually talking to others is really what spurs the, the my change in thinking. Hmm. Right, yeah. I, my, my reading mostly con, con, confirms what I thought I already knew. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, you put a filter on the reading, right? <laughs> right, right, right. right. Talk right. to I'm other people that either. they'll ask you questions that might be challenging. <laughs> right, I, you know, and and um, and right, and we all kind of gravitate to what we. Um, kind of relaxes us not necessarily it teaches us yeah okay all right now what's the best way to keep a project on track best way to keep project on track is realize that no startup no project failed because they were too focused okay <laughs> so therefore it is what you say you're what roads you're not going down not continually thinking of roads that you might go down. So yeah. staying singularly focused, I think that's the way to do it, is that you literally have to get myopic in. Once you've figured out you have a little bit of product market fit or you think you're onto the right thing or what it is, is, is go deep fast. You can, at the beginning, you can search wide, but do your search wide, in my opinion, early, and then stay on, um, keep a project on track by not entertaining new, new ideas and not you know, I come from an engineering world where we would do software that would be in releases and the software releases would version. And before you sell your first piece of software, you would set these artificial milestones or you have a customer who'd say, oh, they really would use it if you made one. And um, and you'd realize those were wrong. It's keep to your goal and, and really um, only, you know, only change direction when you really get real evidence, not real opinion. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. The yeah, power of focus is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's it's so true. I mean, I was talking to this company the other day when that I advised in the United States. They had something called the Small Business Innovation, you know, SBIR, which is give small businesses money from the government, and they couldn't make up their mind. They they have this wonderful technology could be used for a million things, and every time they talk to somebody, they um, they come back and think, well, we could just do a little, like a little bit of a proof of concept to see. And you go, well, how are you going to ever get anything done if you never leave the lab, mm -hmm. right? Right. And, right. And and making product is leaving the lab, right? It's getting, you know, people forget that a, a company is more than just the, the product. It's everything from brand to customer support to sales to channel mm -hmm. to distribution to partners to active, you know, to key technologies, all of those things have to come together. And if you don't have a clear plan for each one of them, you know, you're going to get diverted. Yeah. Yeah. So keep focused. And, and I like the going deep fast. Yeah. All right. And what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? The number one thing they can differentiate is actually understand Right to differentiate is actually understand what value you create that others don't. Hmm. Yeah, right? that focused right. on value. Right. I mean, right, right. Because people don't buy things because they um, the, it has a function or future. They buy it because of the value it creates for them. And mm -hmm. if you can differentiate your value, then that will allow you to differentiate your product or your innovation. And that's what you'll get funded on. Right. Mm -hmm. And then. It, can you adapt to the change, right? Is it, um, but first is differentiate on value. Hmm. Great. Wonderful advice. All right. Well, thanks, Steve. This has been fabulous. Now, where can people find out more about you and maybe even... You can write me. I, well, 
I'm, I'm not as, you know, um, I'm not as public because I worked for the movie industry for years and, <laughs> you know, you'd never wanted to get, uh, get your name in the paper beyond the names of the movie stars and the, um, and the directors and the studio executives. So you can get me at S Weinstein at Stanford.edu. Um, Excellent. it's probably the best way to find me. All right. And we'll right. post that in the show notes as well. So do you have some parting advice for our listener today? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think if you really have spent the last few years wishing that you were making a difference, right, that you were that you're not as happy and think about going, you know, in your local community, thinking of just starting small, what what thing can you make an impact on? What mm. what you know, and is there an innovative solution that you want to work on? And you can, you know, just locally figure out if there's someone else who has it. The wonderful thing about mission driven entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship is there are passionate people who are looking for creative people who are looking for technologists. They are they they because they don't know themselves. So if you're an entrepreneur, there is a whole group of people who are waiting to add you to their um, their mix, right? Because they inherently have you know that's not in their um, DNA currently. Right. Right. I love it. So finally, who else do I need to get on this podcast and why? Um, given that you've done hundreds of these, um, where where do you feel you're lacking? Where, where's the hole? Um, <laughs> you know, like if we want to go in mission-driven entrepreneurs, right? You might think about um, this woman, Radhika Melpani, who used to work at Google, um, or Anne May Chang. You know, there's another, uh, she's done, you know, stuff in social meets lean. Um, she wrote a book. Um, if you're thinking about, you know, the hacking for environment, um, you know, we, um, the common mission project, which is the nonprofit above, um, BMNT that's kind of taking hacking for defense and mission driven entrepreneurship to Australia. There's a guy named Jamie Watson, um, uh, who just announced the creation of, of common mission, um, Australia yesterday. Oh, um, right. Okay. All right. Well, those are a couple. I mean, yeah. All right. Happy to well, introduce you to any of those. Excellent. Well, we'll get introductions to them from you, and we'll reach out and see if we can bring them on the show too. Sure. No worries. So it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Steve. It's been a pleasure to speak with you, and I've really enjoyed this. And um, let's keep in touch. Yeah. Anything I can do to help, or anybody of your listeners who um, is interested in any of these topics, I'm happy to kind of. You know, everything we do, and I, or at least I do, is all open sourced and, you know, everything's available. So I'm um, happy to send you anything or just help you in any way, no matter. One of the things I've realized in the last few years is, you know what, everybody has an impact they're trying to make and it doesn't matter. I don't have to think of it in terms of, is it investable? I'm just happy to help in any way, regardless. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for all that and for what you do. And um, yeah, uh, encourage people to get in touch. Pleasure. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that wonderfully engaging and informative conversation with Steve and took something away from his episode. This was a wide ranging conversation where we covered a lot of areas and I really enjoyed exploring the idea of a mission driven company and how it can do good for our stakeholders for the community and for the greater good all at the same time. I'd love to know what you took away from Steve's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Steve Weinstein. That is S-T-E-V-E-W-E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N. -E 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 all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Steve Weinstein. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Steve, as well as links to the BMNT website, the Kindtrope website, his social media pages and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. Now, if you like this episode, please do share it with two other people that it might help. And if you tag me in that share, I will reach out to you with a special surprise just as a thank you for helping to get this valuable information out to more people. 
Steve suggested we have a conversation with innovator and visionary leader Radhika Malpani, with technology expert and author Anne Mei Chang, and founding director of the Common Mission Project in Australia, Jamie Watson, on future Innova Buzz podcast episodes. So Radhika, Anne Mei, and Jamie, keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Steve Weinstein. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast. We've got even more fantastic guests coming up, including motivational speaker and entrepreneur Scott Mason and nurse turned writer and writing coach Janine Kelbach. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.